Well, it's good to see you guys. Listen, I wanted to uh, take a moment. Listen, my name's Ken. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, Pastor Mike and Bonnie are still on vacation, and so they'll be back soon. Uh, so uh, we're just getting the opportunity, and I so appreciate uh, Pastor Mike's leadership and the opportunity for some of us other folks to be able to share the word with you guys and for you getting to kind of experience some of some of your pastors, some of your leaders that are here. And it's been really good earlier. Uh, I, listen, I, I kind of feel, I'm kind of bummed. I got to follow uh, Pastor Allen preach the first service this morning. <laughs> It was amazing. It was incredible. And so uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, I can just get close to, to what he did. But listen, I want to take a second. Uh, there's something uh, we want to do just as a church real quick. Listen, if you're in the room today and you are a veteran, would you guys just take a moment? Please stand up. Let us recognize you. Yeah. Look around, you guys. Man. We just want to thank you guys for your service to your country. Man, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Listen, we all know the freedoms that we experience in this country, the freedom of religion and our general freedoms, that ain't free. Somebody has to pay for that. Somebody had to purchase that. And so if you were in the military, you're a veteran in the room today, we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. We do not take your service lightly here at New Life Church. And so thank you so much for that. That's, that's incredible. We just appreciate it. Uh, but we are uh, in a series here. Uh, we've been in this series for the last few weeks uh, called Overcoming Temptation. And uh, really, we just, uh, we're going to continue that today. Uh, we've got one more week of this. Uh, and then uh, holidays are fastly approaching. I saw something, Lisa, uh, said yesterday, she's like, I just saw this. There's 50 sleeping days until Christmas. So in other words, you're only going to get 50 naps until Christmas. I know. How many are not blessed by that because you're not ready? <laughs> yes. So go out this afternoon. It's a beautiful day outside. Go do some shopping. Let's get ready for, for Christmas. But listen, Christmas uh, for the church, for us, it's kind of like our Super Bowl. And so we do put... Uh, Man, we put really a lot of effort into making sure that we're creating an opportunity for people to come and really experience the reality of who Jesus Christ is uh, on the planet. And so what he, what he affords us, what he's purchased for us uh, by being here and by coming to this planet and, and rescuing us and saving us. So it's a big deal. And so you'll see a lot of things going on uh, leading up to Christmas. And so just love for you to be involved. We've got Christmas in the community going on. We've got opportunities for you to serve. We're going to have a number of services happening uh, for Christmas, and, and it's just going to be uh, an opportunity for us as a family to reach out into our community as people come, and that's really what's happening. We're reaching into people's lives and really to demonstrate something powerful in their lives, and so uh, be praying for that as, as we get to go uh, as we're heading towards Christmas, I don't know why I'm sharing this. I just want to. And so we, I want us to be ready. I want us to really do all that we can do for our community uh, here in Corpus Christi. But uh, as we continue on in this series, uh, you know, initially, really one of our biggest hopes and prayers was that we would begin to see temptation a little bit differently. That would, we, we would begin not just to see it as this big, scary monster that we're going to have to deal with in our lives, but seeing it as an opportunity. And so the, f the first week, we kind of looked at that, and we kind of saw, you know, temptation, yes, it's a struggle. Yes, it can be difficult in our lives, but really, ultimately, there's a greater purpose for temptation. God wants to utilize the temptations and the struggles like that that we face in our lives. He wants to use them to, to really further and to grow and to develop our character as Christians, as people, so that as we experience victory in these areas with God's help, right, as we experience that victory, that we're, our character is developed, and we're able to extend that and help others. And so we looked at that, that the first week, how God doesn't bring temptation into our lives, but he wants to utilize that temptation to further develop us and create in us, really, a weapon against the enemy. And so for us to be able to be the church and to conquer and to do all that God's called us to do as a church, he needs a group of people that are willing to allow God to develop them through many different ways so that we can do all that he's called us to do in Corpus. And so we want to do that. And then last week, Pastor Bob came. Wasn't that good last week with Pastor Bob? That guy, man, I know. He's not here, but let's cheer for him. 
That's awesome. Uh, you know, just the way, he, the way he fashions his teachings and his messages, it's just you can tell there's just a, a depth and a history with, with Pastor Bob. And I just loved how he talked about just us. There's certain things that we just really are blessed not to know. You know, the moment we're, the time that we're, we're going to die and different things. And really, I, you know, I kind of look at that and I go, you know, there's a lot of things in this world that I don't understand. And I get asked questions and maybe I'll be encouraging somebody or praying for someone or counseling with someone and they'll go, why did this happen or what's going on with this? And I got to look at them and go, I uh, don't know, you know? And so, so, but ultimately, I have personally, the way I've dealt with that is I have a spiritual file 13. So it's like all those things that I just don't understand, it's called the one day this will all be revealed file. And I know that's a long name, but that's actually what I call it. And so, so there's just this opportunity for us to go, okay, I don't know what God's doing. I don't know what's happening right now, but I know this. I know the plans that God has for me right, to prosper me, to, not to harm me, to give me a hope, to give me a future. I know that, and I know this, God has my best interest at heart all the time. And I also know this, I take it a step further, and I, and I know and I understand that God makes the exact same decisions for my life that I would make if I knew all that he knew. To me, that brings me peace, great peace, that even though I may not like what's going on in my life right now, I know that God has allowed that to come my way, and he wants to use that to develop me. There's a, another beautiful promise in Romans uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 28. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those that love God and who are called according to his purpose. Yes, I love, I love that. Because here's what I've found out. The individual ingredients of our lives many times don't taste good by their self. They're bitter. They're painful the loss of a friend, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, whatever that is, sometimes that doesn't taste good. And so I look at that and I go, you know, if I was going to make cookies, which I love cookies, but I can't, you came up and I said, I'm going to give you some cookies. But first I said, here, have a, have a teaspoon of bacon soda. Have that. Yummy. Here, have an egg. I think eggs are in cookies, right? No. Yes, eggs. So here's an egg. Here, have some, have some flour, you know. It's terrible, right? So the individual ingredients of cookies are, are gross. But you put them all together with somebody that knows what they're doing, and you can have a spiritual moment with cookies, right? It's incredible. I've, I had one yesterday. There, I was out of town, and there was a Toll House store. Have you seen these? They're, they're amazing. They're incredible. Here's a cool, here's a cool quote that I found uh, a novelist, Claudia Gray, I don't know who she is. I hope she's a nice person. But she said, self-knowledge is better than self-control any day. And I know myself well enough to know how I act around cookies. And that's what Claudia said. She's smart enough to know. If you don't want to eat any cookies, don't hang out with cookies. She will eat them. And so, so but that understanding has helped me through so much. You know, I may be going through something that's painful right now. You may be experiencing something that's difficult. It's only God, listen, it's only God that take, can take the shattered pieces, the difficulties, the struggles in our lives, work all that stuff out for our good. And I don't know how he does it, but he does it. And so that's, that's the reality. For us going forward, I want us to grasp that promise, understanding that God can make these things work out for our good. And so this week, we're going we're gonna to take it to the next level. We're going to look at the steps or the process of temptation, so what are the things, what is the process that the enemy tries to take us through in order to bring about some sin or some failure or some falling away from God? You know, the Bible says, be careful that you don't fall into temptation. And I, yesterday while we were out at this little park and we were watching, there's this little duck pond. And so me and my daughter and my wife were sitting there watching and there's these little kids like playing on the rocks right on the edge of it. And they're about this tall. And, and we're like thinking at any second, these kids are going to fall in the water. So we did what any uh, smart person would do. We got our cell phones out. <laughs> and so we're, we're watching just in case one of the kids fell into the water. So we could post it and it would be cool. <laughs> but I kind of understood. So, but you see what I'm saying? That's, that, that's the way the Bible kind of describes it. It says, 
Jesus said this, he said, pray so that you don't fall into temptation. So to me, that, that instigates, well, generally you don't fall on purpose. If you fall on purpose, you're, you're like jumping to the ground or something. You know, you're not, it's not falling. Falling, it, to me, it's accidental. Whoops, I fell. And so Jesus said this, he said, pray that you don't fall into temptation. So the reason it's falling is because the enemy does have a strategy. You know, think about it. If you play sports or have ever played sports, if you, know, if you knew the, the plan or the play that your opponent ran every time, you wouldn't necessarily have to be the best athlete to win, right? I mean, it helps, but if you knew the plan that was getting ready to be run, like maybe you stole their signals, you know, or whatever. I know in the World Series, they were talking about the pitchers were tipping their pitches. I'm not sure what that means. In some way, they were showing the batter what they were about to throw. That's gonna help us, right? So we wanna kind of help, kind of look at kind of the way the enemy kind of plans out his strategy because it really is a journey that he takes us on. If, listen, if the enemy just walked up to us with this blatant sin and said, here, do this, we'd be like, no, man, come on, no. But he, 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 there's a process that he takes us through. And so if you have your Bibles, I'd like for us to look, uh, we're gonna start in uh, Genesis, which is the beginning. Genesis, uh, we're gonna be looking at Genesis chapter three here in just a minute. So here's the reality of temptation. What it offers, it doesn't deliver. Even when it does, it adds sorrow to it. So there's been times where the enemy has tempted me with something, and, I, and, and I've said yes and gone for it, and it was fulfilling, okay? But there's always sorrow added to it. Somewhere along the lines, whether it be uh, a drug addiction, a habit, a... a uh, uh, some sort of habitual sin, anger, even anger, satisfying anger. There's an adrenaline that happens when we satisfy that anger, right? So that anger that's inside of us, and then we, we slap our sister or our brother, and we feel that satisfaction, that adrenaline. Am I the only, am I the only one? You're looking at me so dignified, so <laughs> spiritual right now. Like, I'm the only one, you know? And so that was the only way I could defeat my brother sometimes is punch him right in the stomach. If you hit him right... Never mind. We'll talk about it later. If you need help with that, just ask me after, after class. So, so let, let's look at these real quick before I get in a lot of trouble. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? So right away, one of the things about a serpent have you, anybody ever been surprised by a snake? Like you're just walking along and then there it is, right? Like, oh, gosh. And then, you know, you freak out, right? And so that's kind of the way snakes operate. Anytime I've ever, I didn't see the snake coming from a long way off, right? Suddenly I'm walking along and it's like, oh, you know? That's why I like rattlesnakes. At least they make noise so you can hear them, you know? But, but the enemy, that's kind of what he uses. He, he sort of wants to sneak up on us. And listen, there's a couple of ways that he uses to disguise himself. And so that's step one. The enemy wants to, he disguises himself. He disguises that sin. He uses a disguise. He uses deception. And so, you know, at, we got to kind of understand that, that he's not just going to walk up to us and say, here you go, time to sin, you know? It, here's what it says in Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. I'm trying to do this without my glasses, so y'all have mercy on me. But I am not surprised even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. So this is, this is the enemy's first plan. He wants, to, he wants to disguise what's going on. So there's a, there's a story of this, this young man. A little boy and his dad comes up to him and he says, Son, did you push the outhouse in the river? And the boy kind of looked around and he said, Dad, let me ask you a question. Do you remember George Washington and how his kid chopped down the apple tree, but since he was honest, his dad didn't punish him. You remember that? And the dad looked at him and he said, I do remember that, but George Washington wasn't in the apple tree when he cut it down. <laughs> right? So that's one of the deceptions. That's one of the disguises is that there's not a consequence. 
there's no consequence for that, for that sin, for whatever it is. That's one of the things that the enemy will tell you. He'll say things like, no one's ever going to know. No one's ever going to see, right? And that's what David thought, King David. Whenever he sinned, whenever he committed adultery with Bathsheba, the thing that he believed is that he was going to be able to cover that sin and nobody would ever know about it, right? And here we are thousands of years later and everybody knows about it, right? And so, and so that's one of the big deceptions, you know? He told, uh, the, the serpent told her in Genesis 3, 4, he said, you will not surely die. The serpent said to the woman. And David bought that and she believed that as well. So step one is he wants to bring it, he's gonna disguise it. It's not always gonna be black and white. It's not always gonna be out in the open. Step two, he wants to isolate us. He wants to isolate us. So step one, he comes as a dis- in disguise. Step two, he tries to isolate us. He tries to get us apart. He tries to get us away from the fold. It's like, a, it's like the way wolves uh, kill elk. One wolf isn't gonna charge into a herd of elk. They'll stomp him to death, right? So they try to find that one and try to get him away from the rest of the herd, and then they just gang up on him and eat him. Terrible mutual of Omaha, wild kingdom picture. But that's the way it works. You know, he, he wants to isolate, and so that's the way he, he does. Here in Genesis 3.1, you see this easy verse right here. It says, one day he asked the woman. He asked the woman. He didn't come to her when she was with her husband. He didn't come to her when she was hanging around with God, because the Bible talks about they, they hung around a lot. And so here's what Mae West said. said, when women go wrong, men go right after them. And I think that's, that's what happened. That's what happened. Now, now Adam, could have, Adam could have redeemed the situation, right? If he had, if, if he had said, listen, no, we're not going to eat the apple. But he ate the apple too. He jumped right in there and he ate it with her. And so alone, Satan can have us. He can come at us and he can win. But together is when we're going to have victory over him. So here's the gift. God placed us in a family first, right? So he gave us a mom and a dad. There's a family unit there. There's safety in that family unit. And so whenever we're tempted, whenever we feel that pull, we feel that tug, we need to, we need to be able to be open with our family. Listen, Satan does his best work under the cloak of darkness. And the things that we struggle with, we were never meant to handle solo, like Han Solo. You know, that's why he got into so much trouble, right? Because he handled everything himself. And so God placed us in a family and he invites us to be part of a church, a community that's a gift to combat our enemy. And I see so many folks that try to do it on their own. We've all been there. We've all done that, right? We've all tried to just kind of branch out on our own. I can handle this. I can do it on my own. But we were not designed to do it on our own. Listen, there is so much temptation that we face today. You know, Pastor Allen said this earlier, and I'm just going to steal it from him right now, but he talked about how back in the day, before technology has taken off and soared, there was, it was a lot for somebody to be tempted. There, they had to be either in the place, at the bar, there somewhere. Now, everything's just right here. It's so accessible. The temptations that we face are so accessible for us. And so if we're gonna be able to conquer it, if we're gonna be able to win against temptation, if we're gonna be able to see God's best for our lives, we've got to utilize the gift that God's given us. And it's community. It's the opportunity that we have to, to draw from the people around us and say, look, man, I'm struggling with something. Can you help me? Can you pray for me? And, and listen, AA, NA, all these help programs, they understand it. That's why they say early on, get a sponsor. You know, if, you're, if you can't stop drinking every time you see a drink, you want to drink it, then get a sponsor, somebody that you can call. Somebody you can say, hey, man, I'm, I want to drink right now. Please tell me not to. Please help me. Come apprehend me. Do something. And those sponsors, they're, they're going to help you get through. They say you won't even make it without a sponsor. It's the same thing for us. We're not going to make it battling this temptation on our own. Our enemy is too cunning right? He's the shrewdest of all the animals in the garden. He knows how to work us. You know, he knows how to come against us. So don't, don't, do it on our, don't do it on our own. Who are you including in your life? Who are you including with your struggle, right? Who are you leaning on? We've got to have somebody to lean on. So step three. So he, first he's going to disguise us, then he isolates us, then he disarms us. So step three is he's going to try to disarm us. 
Genesis 3, 1 again, it says, did God really say you must not eat from any of the trees in the garden? He's trying to disarm her. He's trying to bring a question to God's word, right? And so Satan understands that there's this process that he needs to take us through. He's got to take us through that process. But God gives us a process too. God gives us the beautiful word of God that, is, that allows us, right, to use that as a weapon against the enemy. And here's, here's a couple of verses that I just want to share with you. Just write these down. These are going to bless you. Number, the first one is Psalms 119, 105. It says, your word is a lamp to, to guide my feet and a light to guide my path. Isn't that true? The word of God, it's a lamp unto our feet to reveal. Uh, 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 uh. That's the devil. He's disguising something. He's trying to tempt you right now. That word of God can reveal that to us, right? It allows us to be able to see that. It lightens our path. Secondly, the word of God renews our mind. It renews our mind. Joshua 1, 8 says, keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The other thing the word does for us, it captures evil thoughts. It captures evil thoughts. So 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. So that's the, that's the verse, that's the clincher for us. We captivate that thought. Okay, because that's what the enemy is going to try to do. When he's bringing that temptation, he's going to disguise it. And then he's going to try to isolate us. He's going to keep us to think we can just handle it all ourselves. And then, then he's going to insert that thought and he's going to try to bring it home. And so what we need to do is be able to utilize the word of God to battle that. And Jesus is our example, right? We saw that, that Jesus, when he was going, getting ready to go to the cross, the temptation was that he didn't want to go to the cross. And we know that in that garden, he sweat droplets of blood because it was so intense. And so he, he battled that, right? But then you also see, if you look at the time when Jesus was tempted, you know, Satan came to him three times and tried to tempt him with power, with kingdom, with everything that Jesus was going to purchase anyway. He tried to give it to him to keep so that he wouldn't go to the cross and purchase that victory that we needed from him. And so we see that, that, that every single time that the enemy came against Jesus, he answered with the word of God. It is written. It is written. It is written. Each time that the enemy came against him, it is written. And so Jesus didn't even, Jesus is the son of God. He didn't even create his own, his own words. He just used what was already written by God to combat the enemy. It is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is, what, this is the way Jesus fought that battle of temptation. And that's the way you and I can fight that battle of temptation. So every time Satan lays out an opportunity for you, every time he fashions a plan for your demise, we stand on the promises of God. We stand on the word of God. Listen, Will Rogers said this. He said, the road to success is dotted with many tempting parking spaces. One of the biggest things the enemy is going to try to get us to do is just to stop. Stop taking ground. Stop growing. Stop advancing in our lives. Stop, stop worshiping. If he can just get us stagnated to stop, he's going to win. But God's called us to something greater. So I don't know what it is for you. You know, we looked at the video a couple of weeks ago about the marshmallow. I don't know what our marshmallows of temptation are. I know the ones that I've faced in my life, and they've been big. Years ago, I, I battled a cocaine, a cocaine addiction. Twelve years, I struggled. And the only reason I'm being vulnerable with you right now is because I know there's somebody out here that's struggling with that. Or that's struggling with something else that's similar to that. But know this, those, that verse, God will work all things together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope, to give you a future. That's what God wants for us today. That's what God wants for you. So no matter what you're facing, yes, no matter what you're facing, no matter what your marshmallow is, know this, God has a plan for you. 
God wants to use that struggle to bring victory in your life and to further his kingdom on this planet. Listen, when Jesus went to the cross and conquered death, hell, and the grave, that Romans 8.28 verse came alive because he took even that death on a cross, the despising, the shame of it, the pain of it, he wore that, he bore that for us. And now that's working together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So if that's you in the room, would you just stand up? We're gonna go get ready to take a, a moment and go into a time of worship. Just go ahead and let's all stand up. And we're gonna, that's all of us, right? God has a plan for all of us. God's working and moving on us. And so whatever it is that you're struggling with today, this is your opportunity just to do a little business with God, just to take this time and to allow him to minister to you today, whether that be through uh, communion, just getting alone with God and having a time of communion, whether that be up front here, just getting up here with God and just having a time of prayer. In a little bit, as we end the service, we'll also have prayer teams up here. Whatever that is for you today, whatever that is, God wants to use this time as we submit our hearts and open ourselves up to Him so that we can know this, that He has a good plan for us, so that He is working all these things together for our good, no matter what it is you're facing. So Father, as we just open up ourselves to you in worship right now, as we lift up every struggle and every difficulty and every pain and even all the successes, God, we lift it up to you right now. And we ask you, Lord, to do the things in our hearts and lives that only you can do. To touch us, to heal us, to set us free, to deliver us, God. Whatever it is, Lord, touch your people as we open up to you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
are innocent. Jesus is our champion. And he wins. So whatever it is that you're struggling with, whatever it is, he wins. I'm just here to tell you that today. He wins so you can win. Father, thank you for what you've done in this room today, God. Lord, we know that whatever good work that you've begun in us, that you will see it to completion. We can trust you with our lives. And so, Father, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you've done. And thank you for what you're getting ready to do in our lives. We love you today, God. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we thank God for his word today, for his presence? Listen, just want to say again, thank you. If you're here for the first time, welcome. We love having you today. Uh, Also, if you came prepared to worship with your giving, the, the giving boxes are in the back. God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you next week. Okay? Bye-bye.